Good morning, folks. Give you all a warm and a welcome to our service today. Just as others are gathered in, we're going to have a praise time this morning, remaining seated. And our opening praise, a lovely piece about just reminding us of the gospel. I will sing the wondrous story, remaining seated. Keep our focus on the gospel as we are going to sing. We're going to sing two pieces. Uh, one will run into the other. We're going to sing first of all at the cross. And just watch some of the words are slightly different, and then turn your eyes upon Jesus. Just turn your eyes upon Jesus. Thank you. 
give you all a very warm word of welcome to our service today. It is lovely to see all who have gathered in, in the main hall, in the minor hall, and a word of welcome to those joining us alive at home also. As we come and worship God, we just want to focus Psalm 105, and it begins with these words. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord on his strength. Seek his presence continually. As we come and worship God, that should be our great passion, to seek the Lord and just to know his presence among us. We're going to begin with... Uh, this part by singing the lovely hymn number seven. Stand to sing, Glory be to God the Father. Let's all come together in prayer. Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, we come and worship your glorious name. We come to worship our great God. And really it is our cry. Glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. Great Jehovah, three in one. We worship you as the God who is high and exalted. We worship you as the God who is beyond our greatest thoughts. We worship you as the God who is the one who made us, the God who sustains this world. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, that this world has been messed up by sin, but even with the impact of that sin of man and the curse upon this world, you still, O oh God, right through history, are controlling things and working out your plans and your purposes. We praise you that you're the faithful God. We praise you you're the God who does what you promise. And Father, we think of the coming of your Son into this world to be the Savior. We think of how he is described as Emmanuel, God with us. We think of how your, your great desire, O oh God, is to meet with your people. We think of the Old Testament and how when the children of Israel left Egypt, one of the first things they were to do was to build that tabernacle, 
that special place of worship where God would dwell among his people. You think of how Jesus is described in John's gospel as dwelling or tabernacling among us, that your great desire is to have this relationship with your people. You think of how with Adam and Eve, you walked in the cool of the day with them. It just is a lovely picture. And how you want to walk with us and to have that living relationship with each of us. We realize, oh God, that the gap between us and you is so great because of who you are and your vastness and how you're this God who is high above the heavens and we're so small and tiny. We think of how the gap is great because you're pure and clean and we have become a sinful people. And yet, Lord, we thank you that in Jesus, your son, you bridge that gap. That Jesus comes to be among us. Jesus comes to make God real to us. Jesus comes to deal with that sin which separates us so that our relationship with God with you can be restored. And Lord, we just pray today that 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 relationship with you would be something very important as we think of the story of Enoch and walking with God, as we think of the the work of your Holy Spirit, Lord, in every part of our service, just the sense that we can know you, we can have a friendship with you, that we can know you dwelling among us and even amazingly in us. May that just thrill us. May that be our passion. We think of how your Holy Spirit is. uh, He is the Holy One. He's pure. And yet, Father, he must, as he dwells within us, see so much that makes him sad and so much that grieves him. Forgive us, O Lord, for our sins. Lord, sins that even others are not aware of. Maybe some sins we're not even aware of ourselves, Lord. You're aware of all of our sins. And yet, amazingly, you still love us in Jesus, your Son. Oh, Lord, forgive us and wash us and cleanse us, we pray. Lord, don't let go of us. Lord, just continue being patient with us. Help us, we pray. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In John 10 and 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. What a lovely thought. We're in the hand of Jesus. When we trust in him, no one is going to snatch us from there. We're going to sing this lovely hymn, There is a Redeemer. And one of the reasons I I picked this hymn is just there's a focus in it as well on the, the Holy Spirit. And that's what we think about today. So there is a Redeemer.
Just a few announcements, folks. Cup of tea after service. We encourage you to wait. Serve from the front here. We cup of tea in a chat for a few minutes. Evening service tonight in Trinity. Uh, just as we come up to Easter, we're looking in the Gospel of Matthew, the part of Jesus being arrested and leading up to his death. So these are very important nights. So really encourage you, quarter past six tonight in Trinity. Uh, tomorrow night, the Ruling Elders Fellowship meets in Ballykeel at 8 p.m. And uh, the Reverend David McAkey will be speaking on the ordinary means of grace. We encourage elders available to go to that tomorrow night. And then on Wednesday night, it is the Mission in Ireland rally at 8 p.m. in Trinity. Different speakers coming to speak about the work of mission here on the island of Ireland. So really would encourage you, if you can, Wednesday night, 8 p.m. And then Thursday night is our men's night this week. Uh, this month, for this month, and half past seven, uh, some games and speaker and that. So really would encourage men. Thursday night, half seven, invite other men to come along. It's a good evening to invite folk come along who don't normally come to church. Half seven, and maybe you're a man who comes here on a Sunday morning and you don't go to anything else in the church, really encourage you to come along if you can on Thursday night. It's a very relaxed evening, and uh, it's a good evening to chat and to indeed to have a speaker and, and a cup of tea together. And then Friday night is the Boys' Brigade display, half past seven, and you're very welcome to that, and do please pray for that important evening for our Boys' Brigade. And then just to mention, there's no youth club on Saturday night. Uh, I made a mistake in the announcement sheet, so it's on the 23rd, not this Saturday, but the following Saturday night. And then just to mention, next Sunday, uh, the evening service here in Brookside will be a youth fellowship service. And uh, the youth fellowship will be leading that service. And uh, it will be a special offering that evening for the youth fellowship. And they're going away on a weekend. just takes a bit of money on that. So I uh, really encourage you to give generously that next Sunday night. If you uh, want, you can do it through an envelope. There's special offering envelopes on the way out. And also you can summon the free will offering pack. And just put youth fellowship or YF on it. And that will go to the youth fellowship. I encourage you to give generously to that. And then finally, I just want to uh, mention a wee finance update. I wasn't here the last two Sundays when the announcement sheet went out, but you will hopefully have read in the announcement sheet a wee financial update of just about our, our general account, which is, our general account is our main account which runs the everyday things of our church. Uh, you give to the general account through the free will offering envelopes, that's the, the blue envelopes, I think, in this year's uh, pack and also any loose offering uh, will go to that. Uh, roughly, we need about ten thousand pounds a month. Amazingly, ten thousand pounds a month we need to cover the costs of running the church day by day. Uh, at the moment, our co our income is about eight thousand pounds a month. So, do the maths. We're about two thousand pounds a month shy of. So, encourage you to think about that and to pray about that. We need about a 25% increase in our giving for that. Now, when you give a finance update, quite often it is done because of concern, but I want to say, and I want to thank folk for giving, and the giving in Brookside is very good, and the Brookside giving is actually in some ways quite unique. If just flick on the slide there, fellas. Here's a wee slide, and this is taken based on 2022 figures, and you see just comparing Brookside with the average figures of Presbytery. Uh, giving to the general account in Presbury, 59%. Brookside, 45% of it goes to it. Property, Presbury, 25%. Brookside, 15%. And here's a very significant figure. Uh, Presbury, most congregations give an average 12% to the work of missions. Uh, Brookside gives 30% of our income to the work of missions. And you can also see organizations' income uh, is quite uh, higher as well because of the very active and healthy organizations uh, that we have. So just shows you a wee bit the difference in it and just the way our giving is, is spread from that. Uh, flick on the next, just if you want to prefer in a pie chart, you can see that uh, the big green there of the general account over to the left of that uh, shows you the presbytery where it's a smaller proportion of the giving to it, but that large blue section, which is really encouraging. Uh, Brookside has always been a very generous a giving congregation in regards to 
uh, mission. And we do want that to continue. We don't want that to stop in any way. But I just want you to bear in mind that we, we do need a 25% increase in the giving to our general account. Uh, this is the main account which keeps our church running, keeps our church going, uh, and we, that cannot be continue in a deficit. So I want you to pray. If you can give uh, some more, that'd be good. Or if you can't give more, to think about reallocating, although we'd prefer, of course, that we do not reduce giving to mission. But that has to increase by 25% in the general account. So we'll leave that with you. Uh, each month in the announcement sheet, we'll give you an update of what's going to come in. I'm not going to mention it, okay? Uh, I've done said it here today, but perfectly consider that, and uh, we'll just give you wee reminders in the announcement sheet about that. So perfectly consider that we pray. Okay, we're going to continue. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Let's all join together in prayer this time. Father, we, even as we thought of finances, there just speaks to the many aspects, Lord, of the life of our church. And Lord, we thank you as a church. We are a family. We are a, a body of people who come together. And, and Father, as we, like different parts of a body, Lord, we use our gifts, we use our talents, our resources for the work of the kingdom here in this place. And we thank you for all who do that, Lord. We thank you for the ongoing work within our organizations. And Lord, we just pray that you would bless all those organizations from Sunday morning, the first child coming in to Sunday school to the, the last young person who leaves on a Saturday night and all that happens in between in all our different organizations. We want to thank particularly this week of the Boys Brigade, uh, be with William and Jonathan and, and Gary and Roberta and all the officers and all the boys as they prepare, Father, for Friday night. We pray that you would bless that. And we pray, Lord, that it will be a night of fun and enjoyment and a reminder of what the boys have done, Father, over the year. But it will be also a time when our great hope in Jesus will be declared once more. And we pray, Father, for many who come to the Boys' Brigade who, who do not, Father, come to church. We thank you that they do come and we have this contact. And we just pray by your Spirit of the Lord you'd work in their hearts and in their lives. But also pray, Father, for the work of the Congregational Committee, Lord, and who look after the finances, our buildings, and other resources. And Lord, we just pray that you bless every man who's on that committee. We pray, thank you, Father, for Stuart as secretary, for John as treasurer, and, and all the other work that many different men do in the subcommittees. And we just pray that you continue to guide and direct at this time. We pray, Father, for the subcommittee looking at the future of our buildings. And we pray, O oh Lord, that indeed you would uh, just direct them, encourage them, guide them, Lord, as to what is your will and what is best for us as a church in these days. Lord, we pray for all our elders, Lord. We pray that indeed you'd bless Liam as the clerk and just bless every elder and their responsibilities and their districts and helping in organizations and in many other different ways. And Lord, we just pray that indeed that in these days, Lord, that you would just just create within all of our people, Lord, a real enthusiasm, a real energy, Lord, from your spirit to, to serve you. And Father, we, we face a, a, a terrible enemy. We've, we have to witness for you and serve you in a world that is hostile to your church, Lord. We were thinking about that on midweek this past week, Lord. But Lord, we thank you that you're the God who causes your people to be as a even that great flaming fire we were thinking about this week, Lord, and you cause your people to be that heavy stone which cannot be moved. And Lord, grant that indeed that we would be a church that will grow and develop and, and reach the lost in our community and further afield. So Lord, just bless all that goes on with us, the life of our church. Bless what goes on here on a Sunday morning, Lord, and thank you for the children and thank you for the children in creche and the children who will go out to Good News Club Bless our children, and for all of us, Lord, open up your word, open up your truth to us, for we ask it in Jesus' name, and for his glory, amen. Okay, we're going to read from God's words, Genesis chapter 5, and boys and girls, you listen carefully, 
Uh, this will tie in with our story in a minute or two. Genesis 5 and verse 18. When Jared had lived 160 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after his father Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Amen. Okay, boys and girls, you'd like to come up to the front for a minute or two, please, and I'll speak to you. Thank you. Okay, just one other wee announcement. Next Sunday morning is the Sunday School Big Breakfast, okay? And that and that's normal time, quarter past ten. And uh, boys and girls go to Sunday. If you have friends in Sunday School or, or in school or play group who don't go to Sunday School normally, uh, you fight them along. You ask if they can ask their mummies and daddies to come along. And we encourage the congregation to pray for that. That is a very important and can be very effective. So. We all have to engage in that as well. Big breakfast next Sunday. Sorry, everybody else is not invited, okay? Uh, you're not invited to. Okay, boys and girls. Now, it's been a few weeks since I've been with you, but uh, flick on the next picture, fellas, please. We were thinking a couple of weeks ago about, oh, trouble. And here we have the first two sons, Cain and Abel. And you remember Cain, he killed his brother Abel. Okay, now... I hope you're not nasty to brothers and sisters. I hope not. I hope you're really kind to uh, brothers and sisters. Well, as a punishment, we see in the next picture, Cain was left to wander the earth. He didn't have a settled life. Things weren't good. When we go against God and go against God's way, it's trouble, girls. It really is. And so Cain had to wander the earth. Now, the Lord placed a mark on his head. Now, we don't know what the mark was to protect him so that other people wouldn't hurt him at this time. Now, here's a question some people ask. Where do these other people come from? And Cain would marry. We see in the next picture, Cain marries. And the question is, where did Cain's wife come from? Where did she come from? Well, the answer is, Adam and Eve, we're told about some of the children they had, but they had other children. Over time, they had other children who, and in the end, and this is a strange thing, but Cain married his sister. Okay? That's strange, isn't it? That's where Cain's wife came from. We know the story of Abraham. Abraham's wife, Sarah, was actually his half-sister. So it isn't totally unusual. Later on, God said that wasn't a good thing. But as we look at Cain's family, do they look there's a happy family? Is that ever like your family? Hmm, I wonder, I wonder. It's not a happy family. And this was a family which was going away from God. It's a family that didn't love God. It's a family that didn't follow God and do what God wanted to do. It's a family that didn't worship God properly. But they also were a family which were gifted. Over time, one of the family was a man called Jubal. And Jubal was really good at making and playing musical instruments. And that part of the family were good at that. There's another one called Tubal Cain, and he was really good at making tools out of bronze and iron, some of the very first tools that were made. There's another one in that family, a man called Lamech. He was really, really nasty. He was very wicked. He was very cruel. So here was a family which was gifted. It could, they could do wonderful things with music and tools and the things they made. 
but they were a family that was cruel and a family that was away from God. But we see in the next picture, God gave Adam and Eve another son to replace Abel, the good son, the righteous son who was killed. And this son is called Seth. And Seth would grow up and he would be different from Cain. We see in the next picture, they would worship God in the right way, offering sacrifices for God. They would live to please God. So they worship the right way and they live to please God. And eventually from this family, we see in the next picture, came a man called Enoch. Enoch was a man who in the beginning was not close to God. But then something very special happened to Enoch. Enoch had a son, and his son's name was Methuselah. Okay, it's not a great name. I love that name, Methuselah. And Methuselah, when he was born, Enoch was changed. When his son was born, he began to walk with God. Enoch began to walk with God. Now, let me tell you something about Methuselah. Methuselah is famous because in the Bible, he is the person who has, is recorded as living the longest. Do you know what age Methuselah was when he died? Any guesses? Yes, Karen? 365, higher, a lot more higher. Not 400, not 500, not 600, not 700, not 800. He was 969 years old when he died. That was Enoch's son. Isn't that amazing? 969. There's nobody here anywhere near that age. Okay, 969 was Methuselah's age. And if you want to know why the people lived longer than that day, the world was different. This was before the flood. The world was protected by a special screen of vapor. And people, because of the impact of sin, hadn't fully reached the same impact as today. People were much healthier in those days. That's why they lived so much longer. But let's go back to Enoch. We thought of Methuselah's son would die at the age of 969. Enoch was someone who never died. Enoch walked with God, the Bible says. He walked with God, and then God took him home. God took him to heaven without Enoch dying. And for us to go to heaven one day, girls, we have to be people who walk with God. And let's think for a wee moment or two how we walk with God. And when we come and trust in Jesus, how do we then go to have Jesus as a friend and to walk with God? Well, let's see the next picture. Well, just flick it on there, fellas. Keep flicking, keep flicking. Did we get all the writing? Sorry, I didn't realize it was animated. Okay, there are four things. First of all, to walk with God means talking to God. The way you talk to mommy and daddy and to your friends you can talk to God. Not just when you're going to bed at night or when we're having our meals. You can talk to God anytime. You could be walking down the road. You can talk to God. I had a friend one time called Angie, and I remember going for a walk down in Port Rush, and Angie just all of a sudden shouted, it was a real windy night and the waves were coming in, she just all of a sudden shouted, God, you are wonderful. You could do that if you want. You could talk to God anywhere. Yes, we sit and pray, but you can talk to God at any time. To walk with God also means listening to him. It's not just that we talk, we have to hear God talk as well. And we listen to God through his word. By reading the Bible, by reading Bible stories, we listen. We talk to God also, or we walk with God by spending time with God. Having a wee time, maybe TV off, and maybe just sitting and listening, reading the Bible, call it a quiet time, and talking to God. Coming to church is spending time with God. And then the final thing is obeying God. If we want to go for a walk, our family this afternoon, say, let's go for a walk, and we'll go out to our gate, and we'll say, well, which way are we going to go? And if Kara says she wants to go up the way, and I says, no, I'm going to go down the way, and if we are both stubborn, we'll not walk together. For us to go for a walk together, we have to both go the same way. And if we're going to walk with God, we have to go God's way. He's not going to go our way if it's sinful. We have to obey God and go his way. So how do we walk with God? 
we talk to God, we listen to God, we spend time with God, we obey God. We need to walk with God. Enoch walked with God, and then God says, I love you so much, Enoch. Come to heaven with me. Isn't that wonderful? Our last wee slide, just flick it on there, Phyllis, please. You can know God. This is a wonderful thing. The God who made this world, you can know him as your friend. You can know his son, and you can have that friendship with him. We're going to sing your hymn now, and our hymn is going to sing 10,000 Reasons, Bless the Lord. So let's sing this, and then you can go to Good News Club after it. Yeah, let's uh, read from God's Word once more. Uh, the book of Acts, chapter 6 this time. So Acts, chapter 6. And we come here part of the story of, of Stephen. So Acts 6, beginning to read at verse 1. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number... 
A complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Amen. Okay, so we're coming today to think about the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Uh, we will be doing it at least again next week. It is a very big subject, and uh, it's going to take a wee bit of time to get through just summarizing some of this teaching. Uh, understanding who the Holy Spirit and what he does is very important. This is because one of the, the main differences between a, a Christian and a non-Christian is the presence of the Holy Spirit in the Christian's life. Now, some people see Christianity as a matter of saying a prayer for salvation and then living for the Lord, just trying to do your best. But the New Testament teaches that Christianity is about a new life and a new life in the Spirit of God. A new life with the Spirit of God living within us. Being a Christian is about a life in the Spirit. Now, several weeks ago, we were thinking, first of all, of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And while the Holy Spirit is a distinct person within the Trinity, he is united to God the Father and united to God the Son. The Holy Spirit is not some impersonal force, but he comes to us with the personality of the Father and the personality of the Son, the Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit brings to us the presence of God. The Holy Spirit brings to us the presence of Jesus Christ. He makes Jesus real to us. The Holy Spirit gives us a living encounter with the living God. And then we thought about receiving the Holy Spirit. We saw that in the book of Acts, that while initially, in the case of the apostles and some others, that the Holy Spirit entered these people sometime after salvation. But as you make your way through the book of Acts, you see that it becomes then the normal experience for all believers to receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. Really, in a sense, in the book of Acts, you're progressing from an Old Testament to a New Testament experience of the Spirit. Christians receive the Holy Spirit at salvation, and Christians are to seek for an ongoing filling with the Holy Spirit, to have an ongoing experience with the Holy Spirit in our lives day by day. And then thirdly, we thought about some practical steps in experiencing the Spirit. We need to have faith. Faith in, in Jesus, of course, for salvation, but also faith in what Jesus gives to us in the Holy Spirit. We need to have obedience. We need to live a life that is devoted to the Lord and His will. Two will not walk together unless they agree. And so we have to obey. And then prayer is important. The Holy Spirit comes to people as they pray. 
Jesus taught, ask, and it shall be given to you. And in that context, he was actually speaking about the work of the Holy Spirit. And then we think in Acts 4, of that great prayer meeting after Peter and John had been uh, basically put on trial by the Sanhedrin and then released, the Holy Spirit, as they prayed, the Holy Spirit came upon that building, it shook that building, and filled them, every believer that was there. So the Holy Spirit comes through prayer. And then God's Word. The Holy Spirit comes with the Word of God. We think of Cornelius, and as Peter spoke to Cornelius and his family, the gospel message, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as God's Word was being delivered. Jesus said something very interesting in John 6. He says, the words I speak to you are spirit. There's a unity between the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God comes to us through the Word of God. Now, as we think of this subject of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts today, and take it a bit further, we're going to think now about God's Word and the Holy Spirit a little further. In the book of Acts, it is very clear that God's Word in the form of the Old Testament Scriptures, that it had its origin in the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1 and verse 16, Peter said this, Brothers, the Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. And he's thinking about the Psalms. So that the, the Psalms, which David wrote, were written by the Holy Spirit. Paul in Acts 28 said, The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers, through Isaiah the prophet. And he goes on and quotes from Isaiah. So the prophecy of Isaiah was given by the Holy Spirit. There's a lovely wee verse in one of Peter's letters how these men of old wrote or spoke as the Spirit carried them along. Uh, it gives me the picture of a sailing boat. You put your sailing boat out and the sail goes up and the wind just carries it along. These men were carried along by the Holy Spirit to write what God wanted them to write. So the Holy Spirit is one who has given us God's word in the Old Testament. And then in the book of Acts, God's word continues to be delivered to his people through the apostles, through the Holy Spirit. Twice in Acts, we come across a prophet called Achabus. And we read in Acts eleven twenty eight 28, that Achabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the land. And then in Acts 21, we read of Achabus again saying, He took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit. This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And so the Holy Spirit through the apostles and through other prophets, was continuing to bring God's word in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit gives insight into the things of God. The Holy Spirit opens up the, the spiritual and eternal world which is hidden to us. And he did this in the, in the book of Acts through prophets, apostles, and others. A good example is this is Stephen, what we are reading right earlier. In Acts 7 and verse 55, we read that Stephen says, But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Things which no human could see or, or grasp themselves, the Holy Spirit opens their minds, opens their spiritual eyes to see these things of God. Now, as you progress through the New Testament, and as more and more the teachings of Jesus and the apostles are written down for us, the focus moves away from new prophecy to the written scriptures as the source of God's word for his people. And we have that great passage in 2 Timothy 3 where Paul says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, 
equipped for every good work. So it's a move away from prophecy given through people to the Word of God. That's the focus as you move through to the New Testament and as the New Testament is completed. And so today we, we don't need the Holy Spirit to give us fresh prophecy because we have the completed Scriptures which are sufficient for us to, to make us competent and equipped for every good work. But we do need the Holy Spirit. It's His book. And the Holy Spirit is the one who needs to enlighten God's Word for us. He's the one who needs to give us understanding. He is the one who can take us into the depths of that Word to take us into that spiritual and eternal world of God. He, through the Scriptures, gives us a vision of God and of the world which we cannot see. Paul said, The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. That's a man by himself and his own powers. He cannot accept these spiritual things, things that come from the Spirit of God. He can't accept them by himself. And the Word of God comes from the Spirit of God. So man by himself cannot grasp it. And so we need the Spirit of God. It's only with the Spirit of God that people can understand properly, grasp and believe the Word of God. That's why people do not become Christians who hear the Word of God and doesn't change it because the Holy Spirit hasn't come to take it home to them. And as Stephen was given by the Holy Spirit a vision of God's glory and a vision of the exalted Christ standing at the right hand of God through that direct revelation, the Holy Spirit today equally gives us a vision of God's glory and gives us a vision of the exalted Christ. The Holy Spirit does that today through the Scriptures. And this is something we need to look for. Something that came up this past week as we were thinking in our grow groups, one of the things came up is about how people receive God's Word. And one of the examples I used was the the purpose of parables. And why did Jesus use parables? Now, initially you think Jesus gave us parables to make his teaching simpler for people. But if you read the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, you have the parable of the sower, And then you have that passage where parables and the purpose of parables is explained. And it basically talks about people not seeing and not understanding. And then we have the disciples asking Jesus and Jesus explaining to them further what the parable of the sower meant. And really what this means is there's people who were listening to Jesus and they just wanted a wee story. They didn't want anything that would change them. They just wanted to be entertained with a story. And in a parable, they got what they wanted, a little story. But there were the disciples who were different. They wanted more than that. They wanted to go into the depths of God's Word. They wanted to know more from Christ. And so they asked and they searched, and they went deeper. So you had the people who had the story, And you had the disciples who, with Jesus' help, had the deeper meaning of the story. And in many ways, there are two types of people who hear God's Word, who read God's Word, who listen to God's Word being preached. There are people who just have the superficial story. And they can listen to a sermon, and it's superficial. And it goes over them, and it doesn't change them. They might have been interested by it, they might not be interested by it, but it doesn't change them. But then you have people who the Holy Spirit comes upon. The Holy Spirit takes that word and takes it into the mind, into the soul of the person, convicts them, rebukes them, encourages them, changes them. You see the difference that the Holy Spirit makes? If we do not have the Holy Spirit as we read God's word by ourselves, if we do not have the Holy Spirit as God's word is preached, it's just a a ritual we're going through. Or it's just, can I say, like a form of evangelical entertainment. We're just having our interest aroused, no more. But 
That's not what the Word of God should be doing. The Word of God, by the power of the Spirit, should be going deep within our souls. It should be changing us. It should be bringing us the truth of Christ. It should cause us to see the wonder of God's glory, the exalted Jesus, bringing us into a knowledge of Him. The Word of God should be burning in our hearts through the work of the Holy Spirit. That is what we should be praying for. As we read the Bible ourselves, and as God's Word is preached and taught week by week within the services of worship and within the organizations. That's what we need to pray for. This past week, for those of you who were at the, the grow groups and that, one of the things we were encouraged to pray for was that I, I'm going into assemblies at the moment. It just happens that I'm going into three schools in a fortnight, speaking to over 800 children. What a privilege. Now, I can go in and speak to those 800 children and it'd just be a wee story and there's no impact. That's why I'm encouraging people to pray for that. I want to speak to those children about Easter, about Jesus and why he's come so that by the Spirit of God it would penetrate the hearts of those 800 children. It's not a big difference. And that difference is brought about by the Holy Spirit of God alone. He alone opens up the word. He alone causes people to believe that word and to be changed by that word. And so as we come to God's word, we always have to seek the Holy Spirit to help us. So, the word of God and the Holy Spirit. And then, point five, which is our second point today, I want to think about guidance and the Holy Spirit. And this quite intrigued me. As I Basically, in preparation for these sermons, what I did was I went through the book of Acts and just recorded every reference to the Holy Spirit. And as I did that, again and again, what hit me was so many of the references of the Holy Spirit are to do with God's guidance for his people. God guided and directed churches and individuals in the book of Acts through the Holy Spirit. Let's look at some examples. Think of the story of Philip, who was one of the seven appointed with Stephen. Later on in Acts 8, we read about Steve, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And then there we read, And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. After that encounter, we read, The Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. So clearly there's Philip being guided by the Spirit. In the story of Peter going to the Roman centurion Cornelius. After, remember, Peter had that vision of the, the different animals coming down on a sheet before him. We read, And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation. And later on, when he was recounting what had happened to Cornelius, Peter says, And the Spirit told me to go with them making no distinction. He was guided by the Holy Spirit. Peter was very clear that his guidance was from the Spirit. Another clear example of the guidance of the Spirit is how the Apostle Paul began his first missionary journey. In Acts 13, it says of the church in Antioch, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. This is then followed by this comment from Luke. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So clearly there is a church that is guided by the Holy Spirit. And there are many other examples throughout the book of Acts of the Holy Spirit guiding people and churches. The guidance of the Holy Spirit in those days appears to have been by him directly speaking to people. Now, the book of Acts doesn't elaborate whether this was an audible voice, I don't think it was, or more likely it was an inward voice within people. Now, is this how the Holy Spirit guides us today? Does the Holy Spirit guide us with like an inward voice directly today as he did 
in the book of Acts. And if the Holy Spirit guides us directly today with that inward voice, how do we know if that inward voice or impulse is genuinely from the Holy Spirit or not? Any inward voice or impulse can have three possible sources. And this is a challenge. The source can, yes, be the Holy Spirit. But that source speaking inside can be the devil. Or it can be ourselves. It can be our own feelings and desires that are speaking. So how can we tell which it is? If we hear like a voice in our heads, if a thought comes to us, Is it from the Spirit? Is it from the devil? Is it just from ourselves? And you know, we have to be careful with this because many things have been done in the name of God which have not clearly been from God. Take the prophet Muhammad. His Quran, which he said was a direct revelation from God. Is clearly not from God because it is contrary to the Word of God. Or we think of Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, and his Book of Mormon, which he claims to be directly a revelation from God. There are also many terrible atrocities in history where people have done very wicked things claiming to have heard a voice from God. So, Going back to this question, how do we know if an inward voice or impulse is from God, from the devil, or from ourselves? Now, hopefully none of us here are going to commit murder, but there can be at times where we have an an urge to do something. How do we know if that urge is from God, or the devil, or ourselves? Now, this issue of being guided by the Holy Spirit, it's not always simple, but this is a good news. Thankfully, we have not been left to flounder by ourselves in this. With the completion of the Scriptures, the Scriptures become the means through which the Holy Spirit speaks and guides people today. And we're not to expect direct revelation separate from the Scriptures. In 2 Timothy 3 and 16, when Paul was speaking about that passage by the Scriptures, He ends with this, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So the revelation we need in order to be competent and equipped fully in serving the Lord is from the Scriptures. And I believe the Holy Spirit does guide us today, but the Holy Spirit guides us through the Word of God. Scripture is there to lead us into what God wants us to do. And it is a a very dangerous thing to separate the guidance of the Holy Spirit from God's Word. Uh, Sometimes you might meet people, and people who regularly say, the Lord told me this, the Lord told me that, the Lord told me to do this other thing. Listen, be wary of such people. My concern is, What people talk about as being emphatically from God can be impulses and feelings which may or may not be from God. What happens is that these people are controlled by these impulses, and I'm not sure that that is secure ground to live your life, just being controlled by impulses which may or may not be from God. And one of the things is, if you really, really want something, you can convince yourself that an impulse and a feeling and a plan is from God when it may not be. So how does God guide us through the Holy Spirit and his word today? So what can we learn so that we do not go wrong in this? And let me be clear. The Holy Spirit is as alive today as he was in the day of the Apostle Paul and Peter. He guides his people today, but how does he do it through his word today in this more secure way? Well, let me just give you a few wee points. First of all, pray regularly for the Holy Spirit to breathe upon your study of God's word and to speak to you through it. 
pray for the Holy Spirit to be active as you open God's word privately or with God's people. That should be our prayer, for the Holy Spirit to be moving upon it and moving upon us as we read it. James says you do not have because you do not ask. We can't just assume that the Spirit will be moving. We have to ask for the Spirit to be moving as we open God's Word and have God's Word preached. Secondly, read God's Word regularly and systematically and not impulsively. I worked in a Christian bookshop and they had this wee box which you could sell to people called a box of blessings and in this wee box were little scrolls and the idea was you took a little scroll out at different times and you had a wee bible verse to to bless you Uh, the the person who who owned the shop he called this the the christian lucky dip uh, in that but some people that's the way they read their bibles just like a lucky dip i believe one of the safest safest ways you can have confirmed what God is guiding you to do is through your regular quiet time, your regular Bible reading. When we come to the Bible regularly, this is harder for us to manipulate in regards to our feelings. It's as God continues to teach us day by day as we open the Bible and work our way through books of the Bible, then We can't manipulate that, and God will guide us in a safer way through that. If you just open the Bible at random and look for some verse to justify a path that you want to take, you will will be able to find it. You can justify anything if you just open the Bible in that lucky dip way. But that is not the way to study God's Word. The most famous example of that lucky dip way is the boy who opened his Bible In Matthew 27, verse 5, which says, Judas went out and hung himself. And then he opened his Bible at Luke 10, and verse 37, which says, go and do likewise. And then he opens his Bible in John 13, verse 27, which says, what you have to do, do it quickly. That's a silly example. But that is exactly how some people get guidance. They just look for a verse. Another example of that abuse is a man who wouldn't get out of bed in the morning until the Holy Spirit told him to get out of bed in the morning. And so that man lay on for many, many hours every day until the Holy Spirit told him to get out of bed. If that man had read his Bible, he would have known that the Holy Spirit had told him to get out of bed because the Holy Spirit in the Bible tells us to be diligent, to be faithful. It tells us to make good use of our time. It tells us not to be lazy, not to be slothful. So the Holy Spirit had told him, but he was looking some impulse when what he needed to have was an open Bible before him. So read God's Word regularly and systematically. Thirdly, read God's Word looking for God's character, God's priorities, God's commands for biblical principles and godly examples. The key to knowing the guidance of the Holy Spirit is not primarily about following impulses. The key to being guided by the Spirit is, as we read the Bible, developing a Christ-like mindset. And so, like that boy who lay in bed, if he read the Bible, he would have seen the godly example of people who were faithful and diligent serving the Lord. He would have seen the warning of Peter who, or sorry, not Peter, David, who was lying in bed at lunchtime when he should have been out and fighting the battles of the Lord. You read the Bible to discover what God is like, what God's priorities are like, what the principles are that govern our life, what God's commands are for us, what the godly examples are. As you read the Bible that way, you're being trained to live a life in following the Spirit. The Spirit guides us as we grow and mature in the Word of God. Fourthly, sit consistently under the systematic teaching of God's Word in your church. If you want to be guided by the Spirit, you need to do that. In the book of Acts, guidance was not just a personal thing developed by 
themselves in a quiet wee corner. As in the case of Paul and Silas in the first missionary journey, it was something that happened in the place of worship. The danger, you see, of just relying on personal and private Bible study is that we all have our own bias. We all have our own personal preferences. We all have our own blind spots and prejudice as we come to study God's Word. Sitting under the teaching of God's Word in the church, meeting and engaging with brothers and sisters in Christ to discuss God's Word together, we have the benefit of their insight we have the benefit of their help so that our blind spots, our prejudice, are dealt with. I know some of you do not like the, having Bible studies where we discuss things together. Let me tell you this. This is biblical. It is a biblical thing for Christians to come together to study God's Word together, to discuss God's Word together. And if you do not like that form of Bible study, you do not have a choice of just saying, I'm going to opt out of that because I don't like it. You need that. You need to meet with Christians. You need to meet with Christians and to hear how they are living out God's word in their life. That is how God's spirit helps to guide us. As a family of brothers and sisters, we study that truth together. You know, it's so important we do that together. We are a body of Christ, and God's Spirit does not act independently of the body. He works through the church of Jesus Christ. And the final thing is pray regularly to ask if your heart is willing to submit to the Holy Spirit's guidance. The biggest problem of guidance is not up here, our minds. The biggest problem of guidance is there our hearts. The biggest problem of guidance is not necessarily knowing God's will. The biggest problem of guidance is being willing to follow God's will for our lives. That's the challenge. And we need to pray, Lord, as I read your word, as I come to church, as I meet with God's people, Lord, am I really committed to surrendering to your will, to surrendering to the path that your spirit through the word wants to guide me? Have I a heart that is so yielded to Christ? So look at those five points. Pray regularly for the spirit as you come to God's word. Read God's word regularly and systematically. Read God's word looking for God's character, commands, and principles. Sit consistently under the systematic teaching of God's word in the church and pray regularly for a heart that is surrendered to the will of God. We live in a world of so much confusion. We live in a world of so much darkness. But this is a wonderful thing, Christian, and this is what the world should see in you. We have the Word of God. We have the Spirit of God. We have these two powerful friends to clearly guide us as believers through the perplexing paths of this life. The Word of God and the Spirit of God together. We have everything we need as the Spirit opens this book to know exactly what God wants of us and how God wants to guide us. So let's get on our knees. Let's open our Bibles and pray for the Spirit to breathe upon this Word and to breathe upon us as we study it together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word today and thank you so much for the clear examples of your spirit and, and how he works with your word in the book of Acts. Thank you, Father, for the completed scriptures. Thank you, Father, that we have this word to, so we can be competent and fully equipped in living and serving you in these days. Uh, and Lord, help us just to know more and more the spirit's impact in our lives creating a, a desire, Father, to know your word, a desire to know Christ in a deeper way, a desire to live for Christ. Oh, Father, help us and forgive us where we have been negligent, Lord, and 
on faithful and reading your Bible and studying your word in our homes, Lord, where we've been unfaithful and doing that as families, where we've been unfaithful, Father, in, in coming to the, hear the teaching of your word within the church. Lord, help us just to believe and to understand the great blessing that comes as your word and spirit work together just to take us into the very depths with Christ. Oh Lord, cause that to happen for us that the world will see that we are a different people and that see in us the hope that they need to grasp. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing together an old hymn from our hymn book, hymn 190. Come, Holy Spirit, come. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship, power, and presence of God the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.